Coming up on Theater Talk. Well, what I did with a strip, not knowing where I was going, uh, was start with one line. And if I had a direction, I had something in mind that where I wanted to go, I'd go there. If I had nothing in mind, I'd just basically scribble until something happened. And something always did happen. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Our guest this week is one of the greatest artists of my lifetime. I'm so <laughs> impressed that he's here, Mr. Jules Pfeiffer. Welcome to Theater Talk. I'm so Talk. impressed by that. <laughs> She's laid it on thick, Jules. He's a Watch playwright. <laughs> he's a writer. Not that thick. <laughs> Playwright, writer, and most important, I say, the, the great, great art form. You are a cartoonist, a, a, a title that should be celebrated in this culture. Yeah, do you find the word cartoonist to be somewhat um, condescending towards, uh, towards well, your the, art? Well, there's a story, I think, in the book about that. I yeah. gave a talk, I chaired a talk at the New York Ethical Culture Society um, of cartoonists uh, with David Levine and Ed Sorrell and Lee Lorenz, who was then the cartoon editor of New Yorker, and I think George Booth. And all of us talked about our work, and they showed us slides, and it was and these guys are brilliant guys, and, um, and I think Ross Chast might have also been there. And and then the first question from a lady up in the balcony, she said, "All you people are all so brilliant, and so talented. Have you ever thought of doing something a little more profound, like going into film directing?" <laughs> <laughs> and and I broke out laughing, and I said, there, this year it is the cartoonist curse. Even our fans condescend to us. <laughs> <laughs> what brings Jules to our yes, show is you. his terrific new memoir, uh, Backing Into Forward, about uh, his life in the arts and in New York. And I must say, I, I really enjoyed this book because it's almost as if um, a friend is just talking to you about the life. It has, a, it has just a, a lovely, easy tone to it. What prompted you to write the memoir? Well, and first of all, I'm, I'm very happy you said that because always in my mind when I wrote the book is that Holden Caulfield dictum of, of uh, you know, wanting to call up a writer in the middle of the night. He's your friend. I mean, the, the, the readers who feel essentially isolated, and I was aiming this, I hoped, at an audience of younger people mm. because God knows if they're older than me, they're not going to be able to read much longer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was hoping younger people would read this, and I was I wanted to to focus the book on the effort it takes to just get anywhere with your work if you're serious about your work right. and how that effort can pay off and is worth it and so much of what we're told officially about uh, how to go things, how to do things, I mean the people in charge never know what they're talking about and 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 and, and the problem is if that were true hundred percent of the time it would be easy but sometimes they're right. <laughs> you have a great moment in the book where I think you were asked to give uh, an address to your old school. That's right. And you, as a young, as a student, had listened to all these people, have all of the, the platitudes of you have to work hard and pursue your dream and all that meaningless stuff. And the title of your book is Backing Into Forward. This is really not the way you've gotten anywhere. So what did you say to your high school? <laughs> what did you say to your high school? Well, I had gone to this high school for four years. I had been at these Hall of Fame, as they call it, gatherings. And I looked at the people on stage who were supposed to be students once, and all I saw were a bunch of old farts, very, dressed very conservatively, talking very conservatively, and the kid had been squeezed out of them. Mm. And I began to think that there had been some magic cutoff line somewhere where, in order to make it, you had to basically have amnesia about what it felt like. And, and, and I swore that if I ever got there, and I was determined to get there up on that stage and be <laughs> celebrated, I would tell the kids in the audience the truth. Somebody had to. And this was in the early 60s, before the 60s began. I mean, before 68, it was about 64 or something like that. And I just, first of all, recounted this, what I just told you. And then I told them, you know, your parents mean the best for you. And, they, and, and the problem is that they give you good advice. And good advice is often bad advice when you're young. Because they say, don't take chances, don't risk anything. Before you quit one job, have another. 
And my mother used to give me all this good advice, and the day I thought, what would my mother say, and I did exactly the opposite, is the day I started to become a success. <laughs> and all the kids got up and, and, and applauded, and my parents were applauding. And, and, and the more I dumped on them, the more they applauded, because their son was being approved of. <laughs> yeah. You helped begin the 60s, really, in the sense of inventing the 60s in, in the Village Voice. Your cartoon yes. was picked up by, by the brilliant Jerry Tolmer and put it into this little new startup paper, right. the voice. But what was what was art like before the '60s? What what did what what did you bring in? What were people's you? What was the repression of the '50s that you changed? Well, you know, everybody um, saw the '50s. I think at that time as this period of uh, post McCarthy, Eisenhower. Um, repression, you know, and um, there was not overt suppression, although there was some degree of that, and certainly the residue of McCarthyism was still around. Mm -hmm. It was self-censorship, uh, particularly if you were liberal or vaguely liberal. There was a knowledge of what you could do and what you couldn't do, and in a sense, liberals didn't know they had First Amendment rights, and if they did exercise them, they were going to be very careful about where they did it. Um, the Voice, which was just a year old when I went to it, was this a tiny little paper whose, whose whole purpose for existence was to give writers who had to please the client wherever they went. If they're going to write for Esquire, they had to do what Esquire wanted. If they're going to write for the New York Times, they had to... There was one reviewer, uh, I won't name him, <laughs> who gave... Uh, who review the same Herman Woke book in, in The Nation and in New York Times, doing opposite reviews. <laughs> <laughs> and in The Times, he praised the book, and yes. in The Village Voice, he attacked the book. In The Nation, he attacked in the, the book. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think that was Norman Podhoritz, wasn't it? Uh, no, 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 no. 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 Uh, 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 and, uh, and that was the time. Yeah, and mm. there was no, if you were a writer, you had to write for the marketplace. The Voice said there's no marketplace here, you just write what you feel like. And, and so it, that's why people were writing for free, because they could express themselves, see it in print, mm -hmm. and not worry about uh, have, pleasing the publisher or the editor. Wasn't this happening to you because before you were at The Voice, you were in kind of a, the cartoonist factory? Well, you were I, working for a famous cartoonist, but you felt, you know, you were just kind well, of... Well, that was years earlier, but, but, I, 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 but that was before I was in the Army. After I got out of the Army, I was in cartoonist limbo because I couldn't sell anybody. Mm -hmm. And I was writing these books of satire, uh, some of which were political, but all of them were social uh, and socially attuned to the times. One about conformity, one about the bomb, one called Passionella, and nobody wanted any of this stuff. Yeah. And everybody loved it. I went from editor to editor to editor in book, in book houses. They all passed it around. They laughed. They chortled. And he said, we don't know how to market it, <laughs> and we can't use it. And uh, come back when you're famous, in a sense, they said. Because, you know, we if, we, if your name was Thurber, we could publish it. Right. <laughs> and um, so I saw the voice on their desk, because all of them had this new startup newspaper. And I said, that's peculiar. Uh, let me look at that paper. And since all of them read it, maybe if I get in that paper, they'll think I'm famous and publish me. <laughs> so that's what, uh, that's what I did, and that's what happened. What was special about what you did in The Voice that made you become famous? And then, boom, you were famous. What was it well, you, you've you done? Know, it's a question I've never been able to answer specifically. Because I look uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Fanographic Books published the first 10 years of the cartoons, chronologically. Mm -hmm. And um, and there they all are. And I look at them and, you know, uh, I think, what's the big deal? I don't get it. <laughs> I think, I mean, as best I can say or figure out. I was talking in print about what these young people were talking about in private and didn't know you could say. Mm. And the comments I got in those early months was not how brilliant, how funny, how, how incisive, how this or that, but how'd you get into print? How'd you get away saying that? Mm. Because if you b belong to that generation, um, you, th you felt unrepresented. Mm. Bob Hope was the funny guy. He had nothing to do with these people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even Sid Caesar was a little old for them, you know, mm -hmm. and, and a little too Borscht Belt. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was brilliant. Yeah. Uh, but... Um, they felt there was nobody who sounded like them, who talked like them, who wrote like them. They couldn't find it in the New Yorker. They couldn't find it in Esquire. They couldn't find it anywhere. And suddenly I started appearing in The Voice. And out in the West Coast, which they didn't know about, there was Mort Saul, who started about a year earlier than I did. Right. So there was this kind of underground forming. And the Second City was beginning to cogitate in Chicago, you know, come, come alive in, in, on With Wall the Street in Chicago. And you worked 
you, you tell us how you, you made your cartoons the way Second City created improvisations. Well, I realized that later on, you know, that, that, uh, that the early years of improv, which was basically founded by Viola Spolin, the mother of Paul Sills, uh, was you have an opening line and you go from there, you know, and, and, and you just build on it and build on it and build on it. Well, what I did with a strip, not knowing where I was going, uh, was start with one line, and if I had a direction, I had something in mind that where I wanted to go, I'd go there. If I had nothing in mind, I'd just basically scribble until something happened. And something always did happen. And if it didn't, I just throw it away and start again. Mm. But it was, it, it was um, not conjuring or not working hard. It was just letting, basically ceding control to the paper and to the pencil or pen I was holding. Eric, I'm going to quote you to you. You say, because uh, you're writing about. I deny it. You say, <laughs> I got lucky with my self pity. I happened in, to, to luck into the zeitgeist, into an entire generation of the young, urban educated who were looking around for where to place themselves, having found their parents' place uninhabitable. Well, after the Second World War and after the Korean War, the country, in culturally, was pretty much in, had pretty much stayed in the same place, mm. except for the youth market and rock and roll had you know had exploded. But that seemed to have nothing to do with the young urban educated. It was more country. It was more uh, um, lower middle class, and um, and for the urban educated, they had nobody who talked for them or represented them or, and so when I was started appearing on the scene and when. Improvisational and the, and the comedy beats. took off. Yeah. Suddenly, they felt that they had they were being recognized. They had a place. I mean, all of these sitcoms that became so popular in the uh, '60s, Mary Tyler Moore and Bob Newhart and the, all the others, came out of all of that. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. And neurosis is a big thing. I mean, you 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 brought a sort of this urban sensibility to your own past issues with your d domineering mother. <laughs> How dare you, sir? Your mother's a fascinating figure in this book. I mean, she is in many ways the driving creative force, if you will, in, in your early life, is a, she not? A, a couple of months ago, there was a new print of Little Murders screened at the Film Forum yeah. down on Houston Street. One of your finest plays. Yeah. And, and, and I was sitting there next to my younger sister, Alice, and watching Elizabeth Wilson, who was in the audience, who mm had -hmm. uh, come to see it, um, playing the mother. And Alice would squeeze my hand and say, oh, my God, oh, my God. She said, that's, that's her, that's, that's like her. And I didn't know what Alice was talking about because by that time I had transferred the whole, my, I thought it was just. Your creation. <laughs> I thought I made this all up. <laughs> <laughs> but what was your mother like? Because you give an interesting description of her throughout the book. I'm fairer to her in the book than I have been in the my plays, plays in yeah. Grown Ups or in Little Murders. Or wherever else I've judged her up, but but <laughs> I wouldn't let my mother ever go see my plays because I, I and I blamed it on the language. You wouldn't like the language, right. uh, and she wouldn't have. But the re the truth is that she would have been appalled by this portrait of her, which um, which simply was what she was. Is it that classic, the classic domineering Jewish mother that so many Jewish comics have written about? Was that that was your mother? Well, domineering, but in a seductive charming mm -hmm. way. I mean, it's, it's, it's tyrannical when it needs to be, mm -hmm. but the authority is so in place that you don't really have to use it. You know, it's, it's the blink of an eye, the raising of an eyebrow, um, uh, a look of sorrow, don't do this to me, I work so hard. <laughs> uh, and, and, um, and you are puppets on a string, you know, and the whole, uh, that, I, I don't know, remember if I read about this in the book, but um, we were sitting around my sister's house at one point with my father who had just come out of the hospital and we're having a very calm talk and we're laughing and then my mother does nothing but walk out of the kitchen and walk across the room not saying anything and everybody something gets very tense and tight <laughs> and, and including my father it just is the energy force mm. of particular people who and the history with them where you know that whatever the norm is it's changed once that person is in the room. Yeah. She was the breadwinner in your household, yes, and she earned the bread because of your father just said personality couldn't make money. Well, this was also the Depression years. She earned the bread yeah. by being an artist, 
a fashion designer. Working at the board. It is so impressive. And she had an incredible work ethic that here you come, Jules Pfeiffer, with this incredible work e ethic that you, and you invent this brilliant artist yourself sitting at a drawing board. You picked up on her work ethic. Oh, as one Jewish mother after another would say to me after I did a reading from the book at different groups, mm -hmm. she said, you turned out so bad. <laughs> Your mother would love that. Love that. <laughs> <laughs> I want to, since this is theater talk, I want to talk a bit about your theater career. And as you say in the book, as a young man, unlike everybody else I've ever met in the theater, you never went to the theater. But your mother loved the theater, and it was all around you, but you never actually went to see things. No, never went to Broadway. Mm. There was a theater in the Bronx called the Windsor. Mm. You know, uh, right. they don't have these things anymore, but before the off Broadway runs, there'd be the Brighton Theater in Queens. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, not off Broadway, but before they went, shows went on the road, shows used to go on the road with stars. Mm -hmm. I saw Ethel Barrymore in the corners green in the Bronx. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, in the Bronx. They used to call oh, the subway that? circuit, I think. The sub something. That's right, the subway, the subway circuit. circuit. Thank yeah. you, I've forgotten that. Yeah. And um, so I'd go to the Windsor, and I'd see, I, that's where I saw uh, Willie Lowe. I mean, I walked home across the Bronx after Death of a Salesman replaying the whole play because it seemed to be right, my family, my father. I was going to go home and start yelling, Pop, Pop, we never told the truth for one second in this house. <laughs> I'd love but, to have been there to see what your mother would have said. <laughs> well, my father would have said, you don't know what you're talking about, you're full of hot air, and that would have been the end of the scene. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Jules Pfeiffer, may I quote you to you again about theater? You say, if I liked to play, really liked it, it usually closed quickly. Yes. If I disliked to play enough to walk out on it after the first act, you could be sure it would either win a Tony or a Pulitzer Prize. Yes. Is, is that still true? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you want to give us some titles? Uh, it, it's, it, I mean, there are, are, are exceptions. Um, August Osage County, that one stuff, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I thought that was a wonderful <laughs> piece of work. Yeah. But there are others which I don't see any point in mentioning uh, nope. that where I just would tear my hair out if I had any. <laughs> <laughs> but, but going back to your interest in the theater, you saw those great productions. When did it sort of dawn on you that you might be a playwright? Well, it didn't dawn on me until um, Sills was doing a production of my cartoons in Chicago. Mm -hmm. it was, he was opening a theater next to Second City called Playwrights at Second City, and he asked me to be the first, quote, playwright, unquote, and to adapt the cartoons. And so, and so I broke it down, I mean, just picked various cartoons, embellished, I mean, expanded a few of them uh, because I thought they could make scenes, but basically took them right off the page on, you know, put them on, typed them on paper. And after we had two acts and then we're into rehearsal, Paul Sills came up with a brilliant uh, <laughs> observation that uh, we got a whole play here of 30 seconds, 50 second scenes. You know, we need something longer. <laughs> Do something. So I went home to Brooklyn Heights, where I lived at the time, and overnight wrote a one act play called Crawling Arnold about mm. a family um, at the time of. Um, air raid shelters and people going underground because of the sirens ringing and you know, this is when kids were hiding under desks, fearing the Russians might bomb us when they, the only delivery system they might have was the U.S. mail. And, 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 um, uh, and Sills didn't like it. Mm. And um, so we never went in the show. But Mike Nichols came out from New York to look at the show and decided that he would like to bring it into New York and he loved Crawling Arnold when I showed him the script. So uh, we did a production in New Jersey at Hunted and Hills Playhouse with Ronnie Graham. And then amateur groups started doing it. It turned out that one actor-proof uh, and, and critic-proof piece I've ever written was Crawling Arnold. Everybody loved it. And isn't it funny that Paul Sills didn't get it? Paul Sills never got it, no. That, he was a hugely influential force, Paul Sills, the director of oh, Second City. Well, he'd be basically invented improv comedy as it was at that time. I mean, it's, it's changed considerably. Into, oh, yeah, so uh, it, now. It, you know, that it was much more of a cultural and social force and about real things mm -hmm. at the time. Right. It wasn't about shtick or getting laughs. It was, and, and I would go for a period of years when I was in Chicago to Second City and see what they've done and sit there with my mouth agape because it was so real what they were doing on stage and so wildly funny and so nutty uh, all of it at the same time, and not everything worked, but you felt you were in the, in the best party in the world with the smartest people in the world, 
and the funniest. And they were really creating in front of you. They were creating in front of you, and there was a kind of aura of decency behind the intelligence. And nobody proselytizing, nobody pointing fingers. Mm -hmm. it, it, we were all in the same boat. We were all in the same 1960s and 70s, and, 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 and it was an attempt to figure it out and to discuss, talk about it, talk about social mores, politics, sexual mores, talk about literature. You could talk about literature at that time. You could talk about books. Yeah. And, and the comedy was pitched at a pretty high literary level. Yes, and I mean, it wasn't dumbed down the way everything in the culture you know, is today, except, say, for The Daily Show. And Stephen Colbert. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why those things are such yeah. a breath of such fresh air. Such a revelation, air. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Don Seward is the best interviewer on TV. You know? Your association with Mike Nichols is fascinating to me. You write about it in the book. He wanted to direct The World of Jules Pfeiffer with songs by Stephen Sondheim. Yes. Now, this sounds to me Bad idea. Like, a, like a winner. <laughs> and and you, you were ambivalent about it and didn't let it happen. Well, I, I, I was not ambivalent. You know, in the beginning, I was thrilled and delighted. And then I saw Mike had not directed anything yet. And I saw him at work as a director, and it was awesome. I mean, it was just, he, um, not because he was doing an Orson Welles act. He was doing just the opposite. He was calmly and, 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 and good-naturedly kidding the cast and directing the cast into performances. But he had such control underneath all the humor mm. and such affection for the company. And, 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 um, and at one point, we're doing Crawling Arnold, and he said, when you go out of the room, I have an idea with a scene, and I just don't want you to see it until we call you back. And I did, and I came back, and they did the scene, and I was blown away. I couldn't figure out. I said, where'd that come from? And he pointed to the script. It's, it's, it's all in there. Uh -huh. and, and, and it was all in there in terms of the, the words. The words are mine. But mm. conceptually, he had done something not, act, not in violation of what I intended, but bringing, bringing out the subtext, which I didn't know until he told me. <laughs> that was there. And then Steve is in there writing songs for the and show. And Steve has written two, two songs that were just absolutely wonderful. And I think I got um, what might be called ego flop sweats. Uh, <laughs> uh, I thought these guys are so great, and uh, I'm not crazy about my material. I'm not crazy <laughs> about my contribution. Ah. I don't think what I'm doing is up to what they're doing. Mm. And so I pulled the plug, and um, and I think it wasn't until I did Little Murders a few years later when I felt that I was legitimate. I, what I feared was that if the Wizards went to New York and was a hit, it would be the end of me as a writer because I would feel I, I, I felt I was being carried by these two brilliant talents, and I I, uh, I would have loved the applause, I would have loved the money, I, but I think it might have destroyed me as. I don't think I could have written Little Murders or Cardinal Knowledge after that. You did have, whether this came from your mother or your father or God or whatever, your, your self-protection as an artist through your whole career, from the time you vowed to be a cartoonist when you were just a kid, and the way you created yourself. You've always had such a good instinct about protecting your inner Well, it, 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 integrity. Well, um, I, I don't know whether it was instinct or simply reacting to the situation as I tried to figure it out. You know, these were very fraught times. This was the height of the Cold War. Mm. I was a very political person, and I was on the left. Um, now, not everything I wanted to do was political, but everything I wanted to do had somehow or other to do with stirring the pot. Because if I wasn't writing about sex, I mean, about politics, I was writing about sex, which also was just coming alive, the sexual revolution and, and the relationships between men and women. And I had things to say about that. So whatever I was saying um, was new to the times. Now we were talking earlier about you know about the fifties and what was big with all of that. That well, the fifties seemed like a repressive time. Out of that repression came Edward Albee and Jack mm -hmm. Gelber and Arthur Copet and mm -hmm. the Living Theater. I mean, so suddenly things were oh, exploding. For, really? for, for, forgetting about what was going over you know across the pond with with Beckett. Yeah. And Genet and the UNESCO. I mean, so the, the this time would seem moribund, uh, and then you had the, the abstract expressionists. I mean, everything was exploding <laughs> all at once. But at the time, nobody acknowledged it, nobody knew it, and nobody really suspected it. Mm, interesting. You're how old are you now? You're I'm 81. You're 81 now. Do you feel which is the new 79? Which is <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel you still at 81 as an artist still have a sensibility that 
young people will respond no to No way. No you, way. <laughs> really? You feel your time I'm is... I'm a bold fart. <laughs> I'm very happy being an old man, but I can't hook into what my 15-year-old daughter or my 25-year-old, Hallie, who's a wonderful actress, uh, uh, um, uh, what they value and think. But still... But still, you say about this memoir, you do hope it appeals to young people. Yes, because, it's, uh, because it talks about the difficulties of doing what you want to do and how to get around it or how to survive it. And, and, and my hope is to how to survive it in good spirits. I mean, how not to be simply a survivor, but enjoying your life. I, want, I have fun doing what I do. I always have. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, as tough as things get and how many revisions you have to do on a piece of work, uh, underneath it all, there's a good time to be had, you know, because if you're, you're doing something you love. Yeah. What's yeah. so bad about that? <laughs> and boy, do you work hard. <laughs> yeah, yes. yeah, but we can, we can it's, give you a little number it's, it's, uh, it's the the jaunty Jules Pfeiffer. <laughs> <laughs> singing, <laughs> all singing, all dancing. It's all singing, all dancing. Jules Pfeiffer's memoir, Backing Into Forward, out from uh, Nan Talese and Doubleday Books. Terrific memoir, and uh, it's uh, been a great pleasure uh, spending a half an and hour. And if you're you. an artist and you want to learn how to make it, Read this book because Jules Pfeiffer tells you how. Thanks for being All our right, guest today. Thanks oh, looks at the ball. Thank you. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.